On this edition of Southern Newsweek, the aluminium smelter is set to close with the loss of 100 jobs, causing widespread concern across the south. The shared path for cyclists and walkers is another step closer with work starting this week. And a group of Otago researchers are looking to prove the benefits of an active workplace. Kia ora, I'm Melissa Barton. A thousand workers are set to lose their jobs as Rio Tinto says the aluminium smelter at TY Point is no longer viable. The 50-year-old facility has been a backbone of employment in the region. After nearly 50 years, international mining giant Rio Tinto is planning to wind down TY Point's aluminium smelter in a year's time, saying it's no longer viable. The smelter's general manager says he's extremely disappointed and his first concern is the health and welfare of the staff working there. So what that means is my real focus for today and over the next period is on the people of TY, um, their safety and their well-being. We have uh, over a thousand Southlanders who walk through these gates behind me every day. Um, they're producing uh, an amazing product, some of the lowest carbon, highest purity element in, in the world and it's extremely disappointing uh, that we couldn't reach a decision that enables us to continue to keep doing that. Despite last year being one of the smelters most productive in 10 years, a reduction in aluminium prices and higher operating costs have seen a drop in earnings for the company. Today's announcement followed a lengthy strategic review, which meant a lot of uncertainty for the entire Southland community for almost a year. So it's been a nine month process, pretty extensive and there have been a significant amount of intense negotiations that have gone on over that time frame. No one could have foreseen the impact uh, that COVID-19 would have had on not just the strategic review but on the economy and, and the world's health. It certainly has had an impact on delaying the, the strategic review but as soon as the decision is made we, we, we want to do the best for our people and that is, is really my focus at the moment and the best thing is to let our people know that a decision has been made and this is the, the outcome from that. On top of the 1,000 workers employed at the smelter, the plant is thought to create another 1,600 jobs in the wider community. Certainly when the decision's made it's quite shocking and is, is devastating and even myself uh, very devastated to have to deliver that news and it's, it's not, not a good day for our people uh, uh, for Southland or for New Zealand. TY Point is the country's largest electricity consumer and Meridian Energy are already warning higher power prices could follow the plant's closure. In Southland, the South today. Continuing from the announcement of plans to shut down the TY Point smelter, Southland business and political leaders reacted to the news with dismay. But they also expressed a resolve to keep on fighting for the local economy. Invercargill Mayor Sir Tim Shadbolt says Rio Tinto's plan to shut its TY Point smelter is shattering and he's concerned for the welfare of the community. All we can say with any degree of certainty is that it will impact on families, on schools and on small engineering workshops that are dependent on the smelter and we it's hard to estimate it in exact terms what the outcome will be, but it will certainly be devastating. Great South CEO Graham Budd is calling on the government to come and visit what is a city facing an economic crisis. We'd like uh, Prime Minister and the you know, Minister of Finance and others to visit us as soon as possible so we can you know, have a, a, a good uh, roundtable discussion around the implications of this uh, decision that's been made today. Invercargill-based Labour MP Dr Liz Craig says the Prime Minister is listening. Just um, talking to Jacinda Ardern this morning about the impact this will have on the South and economy and really keen to look at how we can create a sustainable economy for us here in Southland. So I've invited her and Brad Roberts to come and visit us and talk about how we can create jobs and uh, provide support for all of the communities that are affected. And Bud says while there could be opportunities to grow other jobs in the region, the fight to keep TY Point operating is not yet over. Well, we've got many strategic projects, I guess, in, in play in terms of diversifying and growing our economy. And so uh, th those will continue regardless and, of course, uh, but perhaps become uh, even, even more critical as we go forward. But, there are, you, know, you know, we haven't given up yet. That's the key, uh, that's the key message. 
Uh, so those things will happen anyway, but we, you know, we need to fight to retain um, um, this business in, in Southland in the first instance. It's estimated the smelter supplies $90 million in wages and the economic impact of the closure on a wider community could be $450 million a year. In Invercargill, the South today. The New Zealand Transport Agency says motorists using State Highway 88 should allow extra travel time as work starts on the next stage of the shared path between Dunedin and Port Chalmers. The $30 million project is set to be completed by 2022. The next phase of the long-awaited cycle link between Port Chalmers and Dunedin gets underway this week. The New Zealand Transport Agency is overseeing the State Highway 88 shared path project and Senior Project Manager Jason Forbes says people should expect delays. Um, we are expecting to have up to three single lane closures at a time, but delays should not be much more than five minutes throughout the entire site. Delayed for a month due to the COVID-19 shutdown, it's now due to be completed by mid-2022. Forbes says they're doing all they can to minimise delays while keeping their contractors safe. They will be on time delay um, to make sure that the delay remains less than five minutes. He says if queues start to get too long, contractors will use stop-go signs to control the traffic flow. The railway lines which run alongside the road will be raised and motorists will be able to see a wall with a Dunedin artist commissioned to make the large concrete structure look less like a large concrete wall. Displaying this this artwork, which is, was designed by local artist Simon Kahn. It depicts the story of Matamata the Tanifa who carved out the Otago Harbour. Contractors will also strengthen the rock wall on part of the rail corridor as the shared path will run alongside the rail line. Once completed, cyclists and walkers will have an undisturbed path between Port Chalmers and Dunedin. In Dunedin, the South today. A University of Otago study into activity in the workplace has gone from the laboratory to a real-world trial. Researchers from the School of Physical Education and Department of Human Nutrition are looking into whether taking a two-minute activity break every half hour will be for the greater good. Putting their bodies on the line in the pursuit of science. University of Otago researchers Meredith Petty and Elaine Hargreaves take a break from sitting at their desks with a series of lunge squats which researchers say can benefit both body and mind. So the psychological benefits that we're looking at are um, just general well-being, psychological well-being, so do you feel less tired, do you feel more energetic? Um, we're looking at uh, measures of work productivity to see if you feel like you get to the end of the day and you feel like you've accomplished more than you might have done if you hadn't been quite so active. Where Associate Professor Hargreaves is looking after the psychological side of the research, Petty is from the Department of Human Nutrition and says lab-based trials have shown interesting results. So we know that when people actually do them, um, that they're very effective at lowering glucose levels and fat levels in the blood. Um, but what we don't know is whether people will um, actually do them in their real work setting. Um, so that's what we're hoping to find out. The next step is taking the trial into a real-world scenario with people who work in offices who can sit for up to eight hours a day. And while it may be distracting, she says people shouldn't worry about disturbing their colleagues. We're encouraging people to um, make it part of their everyday and make it a regular occurrence. Um, but if you are in, a, in, in an office where you might be disturbing people, you could actually go out of the office and just walk up and down the corridor and then come back in um, or just um, do something quietly. The researchers admit people may feel a bit shy about doing a series of lunge squats at their desk, so Hargreaves says there are some less strenuous ways to incorporate a two minute activity break into a daily routine. What we're trying to show is can it work in a workplace environment, will staff do it and will they do it often enough to get those health benefits that we've seen in a lab based. The workplace trial is set to begin at the University of Otago with researchers also running control groups to support their studies. From there the researchers say they may look for a Dunedin office workplace which could also provide a research group. In Dunedin, the South Today. After the break on Southern News Week, a group of South Dunedin youths are spending time on a colourful mural that's been a year in the development, and a school holidays pop-up in the Meridian Mall brings creepy crawlies to town. 
So see you after the break. Welcome back. The COVID-19 lockdown delayed many activities, including the painting of a mural in South Dunedin. The Otaputi mural resides on the Cargill Enterprises wall and is a combined project between Stopping Violence Dunedin and Youthline. Leaving their mark on one of Cargill Enterprises walls. A group of South Dunedin rangatahi has spent the better part of a year on this project, from design to nearing completion. Youth worker and artist Claire Rye says it would be finished by now if it wasn't for the COVID-19 lockdown. Because we were supposed to be doing this in March when the weather was a lot nicer and running through into April. Um, so yeah, obviously we were on Rahui lockdown for that whole time and we couldn't come out and do it. So now we're painting in the winter, which is cold and patchy. Um, but yeah, we're making it work and we've still got, we've still got a core crew of young people. The piece features motifs and themes which the young artists feel represent the South Dunedin Rohe. And Rai says taking part in this helps the young artists in many ways and is part of a programme called Good to Great. Um, which takes young people and elevates their skills and their confidence. Um, so these guys have designed this mural uh, and now they're painting it. So they're learning lots of new skills, they're engaging with the community. Uh, and they, yeah, they're increasing their confidence just in life. Looking from the street, the wall being painted is on the right-hand side of Cargill Enterprises, and CEO Jeff Kemp says it really adds to their building. Look, I think just having a mural on a wall, it's good fun uh, to see this, and it sort of just brightens the place up. And it, I know that our guys are going to come past and get a good smile out of it. And but it also is just part of embracing what's happening in the community. So we're really thrilled to have it. Weather permitting, the mural is expected to be completed in the next week or so, with the painting expected to take 40 or more hours to complete. Rye is pleased their work is helping to brighten up the area. In Dunedin, the South today. School pupils were introduced to native stick insects and frogs as part of the International Science Festival, organised by the Orokanui Eco Sanctuary. An interactive ecology-themed pop-up operated at Dunedin's Meridian Mall. A school holidays pop-up at Dunedin's Meridian Mall provided the public a close-up look at native ecology. University of Otago Zoology PhD student Joe Altabelli introduced youngsters to a native amphibian called the Maud Island Frog, which has an ancient lineage, making it a fairly unique species. So most frogs have a free-swimming tadpole. Um, some of the native frogs here in New Zealand, they metamorphose within the egg, so before they emerge and those young froglets climb out of the eggs, hop onto the male frog, the dad frog's back, and he carries them around for a number of days until they're ready to uh, start their own life. This one is just one of three species of native frog that still exist, but he says there used to be about seven or eight species. Unfortunately, introduced predators may have contributed to their extinction. So uh, along with habitat destruction, one of the leading causes of uh, the declines in populations of native frog um, is introduced predators. So they, uh, they make a nice snack for some rats and mice as well. A few of the about 20 native species of stick insect were also on display. These can be found in Dunedin Gardens, and despite their creepy nature, native stick insects are totally harmless. However, wildlife management student Samuel Purdy says introduced animals are having an effect on the survival of stick insects. There are some species which, such as the giant stick insect, Argosarcus horridus, and they're naturally uncommon because things like possums will eat lots of them. And they've done some studies uh, showing that and uh, some places, quite high numbers of stick insects are consumed by things like possums up in the trees. So obviously given the state of rodents and mustelids and everything in New Zealand, they're not doing as great as they could, but fortunately most of our stick insects are doing okay, which is good news. Purdy says one of the most troublesome predators on native species are these cute looking mustelids. Three different species in New Zealand, the ferret, stoat, weasel and uh, absolutely awesome animals they're just really cool but in New Zealand they're a major problem because they're so good at what they do they sneak in little burrows uh, they'll eat kaka chicks they'll eat eggs they'll eat baby kiwis they'll even attack adult kiwis they're a major problem here one of the sort of biggest most problematic species yeah 
Friday's pop-up was part of the International Science Festival and organised by the Orokanui Eco Sanctuary, which is currently open on weekends and Mondays. In Dunedin, the South today. Cannabis, Black Lives Matter, tourism and the economy were all up for discussion during an at times fiery political debate in Dunedin recently. Four politicians took part in the wide-ranging debate organised at the University of Otago. The Otago University Students Association main common room was packed as four politicians from different parties scrapped it out in an event organised by the university's debating society. Cannabis and Black Lives Matter were just two of the topics on the table, but it was COVID-19 that kicked off the sometimes fiery political debate with Michael Woodhouse and David Parker as established adversaries. If we were to open too soon and put risk uh, in place that we had to shut down again, that is a tremendous economic risk. There has to be a better way than what is being proposed by Budget 2020. There hasn't been a fiscally irresponsible government in New Zealand since Muldoon left office, kicked out by the Labour Party in London. Yeah. The present government has acted responsibly and there has been some counter-cyclical expenditure. Backing up both the left and right of the political spectrum were representatives from two minor parties, with James Shaw from the Greens. You know, Michael's proposition is that they left a, uh, a fiscal surplus um, which we've then spent. But let's look at the deficits that they left us, right? They left us a deficit in infrastructure, in transport, in housing, yeah. in schools, in hospitals, in the environment, in climate change. There is a deficit in every single one of those domains and those chickens have come home to roost at exactly the same time as the pandemic hit, right? We've got a, we have a multi-decade deficit that at some point was going to have to get paid for. As well as David Seymour from ACT. Uh, we are trying to build a rail tunnel under Auckland. And funnily enough, all the tunnelling engineers in the world mostly aren't from New Zealand. Uh, they're mostly from France, actually. And if you can't get skilled people in, say, so, uh, you just push the plans through the grounds here, you know, then, then, then you can't build a rail tunnel. And, and that's just one project. The New Zealand public will be able to choose which party's message they like the best in the general election in mid-September. In Dunedin, the South today. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, an Otago academic went to his home islands to research dance as a way of getting people to exercise. And a pair of travelling art curators have brought their travelling art gallery to the South. So catch this and more after the break. Thanks for staying with us. A final year PhD candidate spent last year in the Cook Islands working with communities on a dance related exercise program. 26 year old Troy Tararo Rohe is also believed to be the first Kiwi of Cook Islands ancestry to study at the School of Physical Education in Sports and Exercise Sciences. 26-year-old University of Otago physical education student Troy Tararo-Rohe leads an exercise class where the movements are based on traditional Polynesian culture. So what we've done is we've kind of uh, found an exercise program that utilises more, I guess, traditional movements. So we use our Cook Islands dance and we've mixed that in with uh, traditional resistance training. Uh, but the traditional resistance training is being uh, kind of the sections that we have for the resistance training emulates making coconut cream. So we're kind of trying to get back to traditional ways of food preparation as well as our traditional pastimes of actually moving um, and doing dance. It's hoped these dancers will help people fight issues such as obesity obesity, and he says the traditional elements in his suggested exercise regimes have been much appreciated by the older generation. When I went back over to the Cook Islands, it was the first thing that was said after every single session was like, we love that you've brought uh, this back into our exercise sessions. And just for age ranges, we have our youngest being you know, children, which is seen here, but then also our eldest participant being uh, 80 plus. Um, and we've kind of all just come together to move as one. 
The blending of Pacifica with exercise is part of Tararo Rohe's PhD studies, making him one of the first Cook Island doctoral candidates to come out of the School of Physical Education. I'm extremely proud of everything that I've been able to do in this time, but I've also had really good support systems and um, just a community that I want to make extremely proud, but also just something that we can create together um, to help us be better in the future. Once Tararo Rohe gains his PhD, he's intending to keep on with his new cultural exercise program. In Dunedin, the South today. A Belgium-born creative couple are travelling around Aotearoa collecting art from New Zealand artists in their nomadic art gallery. The pair's Antipodean journey had a bit of a pause during COVID-19 lockdown, but they are glad to be back on the road. Is it a van? Is it an art gallery? Well, it's both. It's both a van and mobile art gallery for former Amsterdam-based artists Arthur Booms and Eugenie Koch. We're like, wait, let's, let's, why not do a nomadic art gallery? And then, and then never stopped. Like it kept growing, growing, growing. And then yeah. here we are. And, and we never lost touch of like, we never hesitated one moment. Like, should we do it? Should we not? The pair have been on the road around New Zealand for the better part of six months and say people have told them their plans to do similar projects, but have praised the travelling European artists for doing it well. Like what you are doing now, we tried to do it in less professional ways, but we can <laughs> sort of professionalise in the coming years and sort of capture uh, artists' lives, artworks, have the story around it, sort of capture the different cities, the different cultural backgrounds, have a sort of a lot of interesting content Blue Oyster Gallery director Hope Wilson says it's a pleasure to be working closely with the pair. <laughs> no, it's been such a fantastic opportunity to work with them. Yeah, Arthur and Eugenia are just both so lovely and they've done a fantastic job of kind of getting to know the artists that are working in need and connecting with people and I think having the gallery outside during the opening last night, having the Nomadic Art Gallery outside last night was just such a fantastic compliment to the exhibition and a testament to the collaboration that we've really this exhibition is a product of both of us. Dunedin illustrator Tarn Scott is one of the lucky local artists adding her work to the mobile canvas and says painting on a truck is a bit different to what she's used to. It's all right you know it kind of reminds me of like art school walls because it's so lumpy and like it's got the same texture. The European travellers say every aspect of the van is to be used including the cassette player as a pair of Christchurch musicians are creating a soundtrack. The Nomadic Art Gallery is set to be around the South for much of this month. In Dunedin, the South today. A 14-year-old has recently gained a certificate to drive on the road. The qualification is not for an ordinary motor car, but instead a huge smoke-belching traction engine. 14-year-old Thomas Kyle of Timaru has recently passed his certificate to drive traction engines on the road. They send down the uh, papers to do, and you do the theory work, you just learn all the stuff and you mark on the test. And once you completed that, you do the practical stuff, and uh, we went for a drive up Christchurch, and it was uh, 13 kilometres, and it's all about uh, driving and firing and yeah, all that sort of thing. He says the steam-powered machines have been in his family for quite a few generations, starting with his great-grandfather who operated traction engines and employed 150 men harvesting around South Canterbury early last century. Well, my great-granddad, uh, he, he had engines, he had 13 of them, and uh, they got passed down to my granddad. Uh, he had four of them, and then my dad got uh, passed down again. These days, there's not too many full-time jobs going for traction engine operators, but Thomas is keen to attend steam fairs and rallies as the opportunities arise. Well, when I get older, I, I would really like to go over to England and go to the big rallies over there and drive engines around over there. That, that'd be a lot of fun. We've been over a few times and enjoyed it quite a bit, so I'd be quite happy to go over there. and maybe do a few runs around New Zealand. Thomas's father and mother also have their steam tickets and he says his 12 year old sister is intending to get hers at some stage. In Timaru, the South today. And that wraps up this edition of Southern News Week. For the latest news from the Southern Region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow ODT and Channel 39 on social media. Ka kite ono.
Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.